each month we, um, we've been discussing one paragraph of Nana, Who Am I? Um, and this month it's the 14th paragraph. Um, this paragraph deals with what is essentially the cent central subject of Bhagavan's teachings, which is happiness. Bhagavan's teaching is all about happiness. And um, happiness is our goal. And also, when understood correctly, happiness is the path. Because nothing, the, the, the nature of the path cannot be other than the nature of the goal. And so since the goal is happiness, the path also is happiness. Um, and um, Bhagavan begins, the, uh, begins uh, Nana, who am I, talking about happiness. In the very first clause, he talks about happiness. And in the first sentence, he w mentions the word sukham. Sukham means happiness uh, three times. In fact, um, in this 14th paragraph, there are two terms he uses, sukha and dukkha. These are two Sanskrit terms. Um, the simplest translation of them are sukha is happiness, dukkha is unhappiness. Um, but it has slightly fuller meaning than that. Um, in, in particularly dukkha, if we just translate it as unhappiness or misery, um, the full meaning of it isn't understood because, for example, um, according to Buddha, life is dukkha. I mean, not only according to Buddha, but it's very well known in Buddhism. Buddha talks about uh, uh, unhappiness. What is the cause of unhappiness? And he says it is desire. Um, uh, but dukkha means more than just unhappiness. I think the, um, possibly the term that best captures the meaning of dukkha is dissatisfaction. None of us are, however satisfied we may think we are, none of us are actually satisfied because when we rise as ego, we separate ourselves, so to speak. Not, we, don't, we can never actually separate ourselves, but we seemingly separate ourselves from our real nature. Our real nature is infinite happiness. So when we rise as ego, we are separated from the infinite happiness that we actually are, um, seemingly. seemingly we're, we're, seem, we're seemingly separated from it. Um, so we can never be satisfied until we again experience that infinite happiness, which is our real nature. So we can never be satisfied. Whatever, whatever we may achieve in life, we may seem to be satisfied temporarily for a short time. We may seem to be happy, but again, the dissatisfaction uh, sets in. And dissatisfaction is the background of the whole, our, whole, our entire life as an ego. Um, if we were truly satisfied, we wouldn't even rise to think anything. Why should we think anything? If we're satisfied with things the way they are, why should we think? Why should we do anything? All our actions of mind, speech, and body are driven by our dissatisfaction. So, um, and the solution of dissatisfaction, dukkha, is satisfaction, sukha. So these are two key words. These two key words in the 14th paragraph, and Bhagavan uses both these words in the first, very first clause of um, Nana. In, what he says in the first clause is, um, that's the first clause of the first paragraph I'm talking about now, just to make the connection. Sakala jiva galam dukkamem badindri epodum sukumai irika virumbadalam. Virumbu badalam, sorry. Um, uh, what that means is, uh, uh, since all living beings um, uh, wish or want or desire to be happy always without what is called misery, without what is called dukkha. And then in the next clause he says, yavakum, uh, yavarakum uh, taniditileye uh, paramapriyam irum, uh, paramapriyam irupadalam. Uh, for everyone, um, the greatest love is for oneself. We all love ourselves more than we love any other thing. And then in the third clause, he says, Priyatiku sukkame karanam adlalam. Since uh, 
happiness alone is the cause of love. That is, we, we love what makes us happy. We dislike what makes us unhappy. So love and happiness are, uh, um, in the state of non-duality, they're one and the same thing. Even in the state of duality, love is always following happiness. We always, if, if a person makes us happy, we love that person. If a person makes us miserable, we dislike that person. We don't, we, it's difficult for us to love something that is causing us, uh, making us miserable. Uh, so uh, happiness alone is the cause of love. So since we have greatest love for ourselves, and since happiness alone is the cause of love, logically, we ourselves must be happiness. That is the, the point that Bhagavan is, is making in these two clauses. Then in the next clause, he says, Manamatra nidrail tan dinam, sorry, Manamatra nidrail dinam anubhavikum tan subhavamana achukate adeya tanne tan aridal vendum. Um, in in order to um, at, uh, to attain or to achieve that happiness, which is one's real nature, which one experiences daily in sleep, where there's no mind, which is devoid of mind, um, it's necessary. Tanne uh, tan arido vendum. It's necessary for oneself to know oneself. That is, since we are self for happiness, since happiness is our real nature, in order to experience that happiness, we have to know ourselves. We have to be aware of ourselves as we actually are. Because what we actually are is ha infinite happiness. If we are aware of ourselves as we actually are, we're experiencing infinite happiness. So this is, this is the foundation of Bhagavan's teaching. We're all seeking happiness. Even the most evil people in the world they're seeking happiness. They're just seeking, looking for it in the wrong place. So we're, we're all actually looking for it in the wrong place because ha happiness lies only within us. It's not outside. So by rising as an ego, we experience dissatisfaction. And uh, so and we, we think that we, as, as an ego, we experience ourselves as a body. And as a body, we have so many needs. We need food, clothing, shelter, and we are, as human beings, we are social creatures. So we want, uh, we want human company, human relationships. We want loving, caring relationships. So many, all these desires come because we have risen as ego and thereby we experience ourselves as a body. Because the very nature of ego, Bhagavan said, ego is nothing but the false awareness, I am this body. So th that's how he begins uh, Nana. Then in the... Um, in the, um, so we, in order to experience happiness, we have to give up ego because he, so long as we rise as ego, we experience dissatisfaction. So uh, therefore, we need to surrender this ego in order to um, experience happiness. So in the thirteenth paragraph of um, uh, of Nana, which we discussed last time, Bhagavan talks about surrender, the need for us to surrender ourselves. And in the first sentence, he, he says it's only by Atma Chintana, that is by uh, self-attentiveness, by giving no room to arising any thought other than self-attentiveness, that is giving ourselves to God, he says in the first sentence. And then he says when, when, um, when God is, uh, any amount of, of, of uh, burden that we place on God, he will bear all of it. And since God, the one Parameshwara Shakti, the one supreme ruling power or power of God, is driving all karyas, whatever is happening or whatever ought to happen, um, instead of we also yielding to it, why should we perpetually be thinking? Why should we be perpetually thinking it's necessary to do like, like this, it's necessary to do like that? So Bhagavan recommends we shouldn't even think about uh, anything we should leave behind, even the burden of thinking we should leave to God, to, Bhagavad, to God or Guru or whatever we, because God and Guru are one and the same, as he said in the 12th paragraph. Then in the final sentence, he says, um, he gives the uh, analogy of, the, of a passenger traveling on a train. Though we know that the train is carrying all the burdens, 
why should we who go traveling in it, instead of remaining happily, leaving our small luggage placed on it, that's placed on the train, suffer bearing it, that's our luggage, on our head? Um, so Bhagavan, uh, the, the path Bhagavan recommends is to give up thinking, give up all burdens, even the burden of thinking. But we, we should be so firmly fixed in self-attentiveness but we don't give room to the rising of any other thought. Because why do we think other thoughts? Because we want to, we want to achieve something. But why? Should, so long as we rise as ego and try to achieve anything, we're actually obstructing happiness. If we want to experience true happiness, we have to give up, leave the entire burden to God. And he will take care of everything, all our spiritual and our... If we surrendered to him, we... Nothing else is necessary. He will take care of all all our burdens. Um, but in this final sentence, what he said when he says, instead of happily remaining, uh, leaving our small luggage placed on the train, why should we suffer um, um, uh, bearing it on our head? He he mentions there uh, instead of remaining happily, so. Surrender is a state of happiness. The more we leave the burden, the more we, the more we carry our luggage on our head, the greater, the greater is our discomfort and our suffering. The more we leave aside the small luggage, we can relax and travel happily like a passenger on a train. When you, we get on a train, we know the train is going to carry us and our luggage to the destination. So whether we carry the luggage on our head or we put it aside on the um, on the seat beside us, the train is carrying the luggage anyway. So why should we suffer by carrying it on our head? If we put it aside, we, um, we, will, we will be comfortable and happy and we can just relax. So he says, instead of remaining happily, leaving our small luggage placed on it. The Tamil term he uses for happiness is sukhamai. Sukham is a Tamil form of the Sanskrit word sukha, which means happiness or satisfaction. Sukhamai is an adverbial form of that. So sukhamai means happily, uh, contentedly, uh, peacefully, we can say. So in the last sentence of the 13th paragraph, he uses this key word sukham. So that is the subject of the 14th paragraph, which we're going to discuss this time. In the, um, in the first uh, sentence, he says, what is happiness? He begins um, the first sentence saying, Sukham embadu apmavin sarupame. Uh, Sukham embadu means what is called sukha. Sukha means happiness, satisfaction, joy, ease, comfort, pleasantness. What is called happiness uh, is only the swarupa of atma. Swarupa means the own form or real nature. Literally, it means, oh, Sva means own, Rupa means form. So literally, it means own form. But it's a, it's a Sanskrit term, but is used in the sense of nature, the real nature. So Atma bin Sarupam means the real nature of Atma. Atma means is a Sanskrit word, but simply means oneself. So but happiness is the, what is called happiness is only the real nature of oneself. So we are self for happiness. That's the first sentence. In the second sentence, he reinforces this by saying, Sukhamum Atma Sarupamum Verandru. Sukha, happiness, and Atma Sarupa, one's own real nature, are not different. Veru in, in Tamil means different, other than, or separate. So they're not two different things. They're not two, uh, uh, they, they're not. Uh, 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 happiness and our real nature are uh, there's no they're not in any way separate they're not two uh, happiness is nothing other than our real nature and our real nature is nothing other than happiness they're one and the same thing um, Bhagavan says that very um, very uh, forcibly and then in the next sentence he uses the term Atmasukham Atmasukham we can take to mean happiness of oneself but um since we since he said in the previous two sentences if it happiness is ourself happiness is what we actually are we can take atma sukha to mean 
the happiness that is oneself rather than um, happiness of oneself. The happiness that is oneself, Atma Sukham Andre Ulladu, the happiness that is oneself alone exists. Andre is a strong way of saying alone, and Ulladu means, uh, is here used as a verb meaning to exist. We can also take it as a, as a participle, is alone is what exists or that which exists. Um, so in this context, Ulladu can be taken either as a verb meaning exists or as a, um, a participial noun meaning what exists. So happiness alone is what exists. Um, aduve satyam, that alone is real. So uh, essentially these two half sentences, these two sentences mean the same. Uh, to say that something alone exists means it's it alone is real. Because oh, when, when Bhagavan uses the term real, he uses it in the sense of what actually exists, to distinguish it from what merely seems to exist. The ego, the world, all everything other than our real nature, nothing other than our real nature actually exists. So all things that seem to be other than our real nature, they don't actually exist. They merely seem to exist. So ego doesn't actually exist. It merely seems to exist. The world doesn't actually exist. It merely seems to exist. So um, in these two sentences, he's, uh, he's essentially saying the same thing, but in two different ways. In the First sentence, he says, I mean, the first of these pair of sentences, that's a, in the third sentence of the paragraph, he says, Atma Sukha alone exists. And next sentence, that alone is real. So happiness alone exists, happiness alone is real. And then in the uh, fifth sentence, he says, Prapanja Porul Ondrilavadu Sukham Embadu Kedeyadu. What is called sukha, what is called happiness or satisfaction, is not found or obtained or available in even one of the objects of the world. We think that we get, if I have lots of money in my bank account, I'll be happy. If I have a nice big house, I'll be happy. If I get a new car, I'll be happy. If I'm able to go on holiday to California, I'll be happy. If I'm able to do this, I'm, I'll be happy. We, we associate happiness or if we're hungry, if I have some nice tasty meal, I'll be happy. Um, so we associate happiness with things in the world because when we have a desire for something and we get that thing, we seem to experience happiness. But Bhagavan says, a happiness doesn't actually exist in any of the objects of the world. So there's no happiness to be found in having uh, a belief. I mean, if you've got a... If you have a, if you're a billionaire, if you've got a billion pounds or dollars or rupees or whatever in your, um, in your bank account, that isn't going to make you happy because that, that billion doesn't, I mean, that billion is just a, a, one of the phenomena, one of the objects of the world. And that's not going to give, uh, give, uh, that's not true happiness. Happiness doesn't exist in any of the things of the world. Um, but, but then Bhagavan starts analyzing why it seems to us that we get happiness from things. Um, uh, he says, Aveka lirandu sukum kire pataha nam namadu aviva katal ninikirom. That means we think we give, we, we, we think that happiness is obtained from them. Um, then here means it refers to the objects of the world. We think that happiness is obtained from them because of our avivaka. Avivaka, vivaka means the uh, judgment, discrimination, or ability to distinguish one thing from another. So avivaka is the opposite of that, the lack of judgment, discrimination, or ability to distinguish one thing from another. That is, it's due to a, a confusion that we mistake happiness to be obtained from, uh, uh, to be uh, uh, obtainable from things of the world. Why we seem to achieve happiness when we get the things that we desire, that's what Bhagavan goes on to explain. Then he, so in the next sentence he says, Manam veli il varam podu dukate anubhavit kiradu. When the mind comes out, 
it experiences dukkha. When, when, when he says when the mind comes out, he means when it comes out of our real nature. In other words, when we rise as mind or when we rise as ego, um, we experience uh, dukkha. Dukkha means dissatisfaction, discomfort, uneasiness, unpleasantness, unhappiness, distress, suffering, sorrow, sadness, pain, affliction. Um, according to a context, we can translate it, but it, it covers all of these. So we are never fully satisfied. As soon as we uh, rise from our real nature, as soon as we leave the pure happiness, the infinite happiness that we actually are, our real nature, and come out to um, view, see things other than ourselves, we experience dukkha. Um, we can say, take it in this context as dissatisfaction. We're never satisfied so long as we rise as ego. When we're asleep, has anyone ever experienced dissatisfaction in sleep? No. We're all perfectly satisfied. We're perfectly happy when asleep. But in waking and dream, we're never perfectly happy. There's always, well, even if we achieve all that we want to achieve, we're still dissatisfied. We seem to be a little bit happy for a while, but then we want something else, then we want something else, then we want something else. So it's the very nature, the very rising of the mind or very rising of the ego from our real nature is the cause of, happy, of, uh, of dukkha, of dissatisfaction, misery, unhappiness. Then in the next sentence he says, Unmail namadu enangal puti putiahum po delam adu tanudeya yatastana tiku tirumbi atma sukateye anubavikiradu. That means in truth, whenever our thoughts are fulfilled. Uh, thoughts here means wishes, hopes, whatever we want. When, when those, those wishes and hopes or desires are fulfilled, it, meaning the mind, uh, adu, he says in Tamil, uh, that means it or that, but he's referring to the mind, which he mentioned in the previous sentence. Is, so it turns back to its uh, yata uh, stanam, means the, it's, its proper place where it belongs. Where does it belong? It belongs in the heart. The heart is, in, when Bhagavan talks of heart, he, he refers to our real nature as the heart. That's the center of everything. So that's the proper place. That's where the mind belongs. It should never rise in the first place. So that is its proper place. So when, we, when our thoughts of, when our hopes and wishes and desires are fulfilled, the mind turns back. Uh, uh, tirumbi, can mean either turn, turn or turn back or return. So it could, we could also take it, it returns to its proper place or it turns back to its proper place. Because when our desires are fulfilled, we do to a certain extent return. We return, we come, the, the oh, Michael? subsides to some extent, but never, um, it doesn't subside fully just by experiencing. But to the extent that it subsides, to that extent, it experiences happiness. And what is that happiness? It's nothing but atmasukha, the happiness that is our real nature. That is, um, we, that is when, when, um, when we have a desire for something or a wish or a hope for something, that's a type of dissatisfaction. We desire things because we're not satisfied with what we've got. So that dissatisfaction disturbs the peace of the mind. So the mind is agitated. When what we desire is attained, the mind temporarily, uh, to a certain extent, it, it quietens down. It returns to its, it turns back to its proper place. It returns to its proper place. That is, instead of rising so vigorously, for a moment it partially subsides. And to the extent that it subsides, to that extent it experiences happiness. In other words, all, the, all our thoughts, all our mental activity is the cloud that is obscuring the sunlight. The sunlight is our real nature, the pure happiness that we actually are. That is obscured by, the, by any type of mental agitation, any type of disturbance of mind. Only in, 
when the mind is perfectly calm, we experience happiness. But when is the mind perfectly calm? Only when it subsides completely back into its source. Then there is no mind at all. So peace, people talk of peace of mind. We can never experience true peace so long as we have a mind. Stillness of mind or peace of mind is only the state where the mind doesn't exist. That is, in, in sleep, we are perfectly satisfied because the mind has subsided completely into its proper place, our real nature. Um, so, and then in the next sentence, he says, Apadiye tukum samadhi muche kalangalilum ichita porul kide kirapodum verita porul ku. Tedun dahum podum, manum antamukamahi, apma sukate anubavit kiradu. That means, likewise, at times of sleep, samadhi, samadhi here means he's referring to the yogic type of samadhi, but which is just a manole, a type of state of temporary dissolution of mind, um, talked about by pranayama, other yoga practices. Um, in effect, uh, that type of samadhi is actually no different to sleep. So in, likewise, at times of sleep, samadhi, and fainting, and when anything we like is obtained, so if we, there's anything that we like, anything that we, 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 we are having a liking for, a nurturing a desire for, when that is obtained, or uh, uh, when any uh, destruction, damage, elimination or removal, it's very difficult to translate Kedon Dahum when, when that destruction ha happens or occurs to anything disliked. So when, when what we dislike, when that is removed, when we're freed from that experience, that unpleasant experience, uh, the mind becomes antamukha, inward facing. Inward facing means in this context, he's using antamukha in the sense of ahamukha, facing to, back towards ourselves and experiences only atmasukha. So whatever happiness we experience, even if we obtain that, we have a liking for chocolate, when we experience it, when we eat chocolate, we, oh, it's a nice piece of chocolate, we enjoy the taste. That enjoyment, the, the pleasure we enjoy then, is nothing but the happiness which is our real nature. We experience it because our light, we, the mind is temporarily to a, certain extent satisfied, partially satisfied for briefly. So that partial satisfaction, is, 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 so mind is, is uh, uh, to a certain extent it subsides and it thereby experiences the happiness which is our real nature. Then in the same, in the next sentence he says, Ipadi manam atma ve bittu velie povadam uh, that means, in this way, the mind wanders about incessantly, uh, going outside, leaving oneself, and again turning back inside. We go out leaving ourselves when we are desiring things. When we achieve what we desire, we are temporarily satisfied, but to a certain extent we subside. So that's what he's referring to. The, the constant activity of the mind is driven by only one thing, desire for happiness. But because of our avivika, we are seeking the happiness outside ourselves. So this, this ceaseless uh, wandering of the mind, this is what is called samsara, a constant movement. So the, Bhagavan says in verse 24 of Ulidunapadu, a samsara is nothing but the ego itself. The very nature of the ego is samsara. Because when we rise as ego, we're dissatisfied, and we go here, there, seeking happiness. We obtain a little happiness there. Temporarily, we uh, subside, temporarily and partially subside, experience a little happiness, and again, go outwards. So in this way, ceaselessly, we are going back and forth. And, and then Bhagavan gives a, an analogy to illustrate what he has said in this sentence. Maratadeil nirul sukumai irkiradu. At the foot of a tree, the shade is pleasant. This, um, we don't feel that so much in this country because we don't have uh, scorching sun. 
In fact, when the sun comes out in this country, we all want to go out into the sun to keep warm. But if, you're, if we're living in a tropical country like, uh, like South India, um, uh, we, uh, the sun is scorching hot, in, particularly in the middle of the day. So we, instead of seeking the sunshine for warmth, we seek the shade for the pleasant coolness. So it, it, Bhagavan is talking from the perspective of um, someone living in um, a hot tropical country. So he said, at the foot of the tree, the shade is pleasant. Again, he's using the words, uh, he's using the words sukham. Sukham I irikadu. It is pleasant, it is comfortable, it is delightful. Um, uh, <clears throat> and then the next sentence he says, Veliyil surya vepam kodumai irikadu. Outside, the heat of the sun is severe or harsh or scorching. Uh, that doesn't actually mean scorching, but it implies scorching. It's, uh, it's very severe, it's very harsh. Um, uh, and then in the next sentence he says, Belial aleum oruvan nirilil sendru kulichi ade kiran. The person who is wandering outside is uh, literally, kulichi ade kiran means obtains coolness or cooling. We can take it as just as cool is cool, um, going into the shade. That is by going into the shade um, after wandering around in the sun. It's very pleasant. We feel cooled down. Um, but a restless person isn't going to just sit uh, quietly in the shade, enjoying the cool of the shade. Again, they want to go out. So, Sirudunerit uh, Kupin, Veli Kalambi. Vepatin kodumeye kodumeye kartadu kartadu marupadium maratadiku barukiran. That means um, after a short while emerging outside. Uh, that's I put here in English the same order of words in the Tamil sentence, but in English we probably say emerging outside after a short while, um, but, be, uh, but being unable to uh, withstand or bear the severity of the heat, he again comes to the foot of a tree. Um, so this is someone, he, they, they're wandering around outside, they get too hot, they come to the foot of a tree, they enjoy the shade for a while, they're feeling cool, and again they come out, and again get uh, burnt by the sun, and again come back to a foot of a tree. Um, uh, Ivaru nirililindru veliil povadum, veliilindru nirililindru salvadum ai irakiran. In this way he remains, going from the shade into the sunshine, and going back from the sunshine into the shade. Um, and then, Michael, uh, yes, Michael, yes, uh, um, so the, interconnect, um, the internet connection is a little bit wobbly sometimes. Uh, okay, uh, is there a place nearer the modem, or I don't know? Um, no, I, I'm as close to it as I can be here. Okay, that's fine, that's fine. Sorry, but if there's anything, if you miss anything, if, if there's a silence for any length of time, I mean, I'm just going on talking, so please interrupt me and tell me uh, that you're not hearing me and I can repeat. So have you missed something that I was saying? No, it's okay. It was just a bit wobbly. Yeah. Okay, so, uh, sorry about that. Um, um, so then in the next sentence he says, Ipidi say kiravan abivaki, sorry, Ipidi say kiravan abivaki. A person who does thus is an abivaki, a person, an, a, 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 the, earlier he used the word avivaka. Avivaka means lack of uh, judgment. So avivaki is someone who is a person who lacks judgment, discrimination, or ability to distinguish. So in other words, a person who isn't very wise. If we're wise, we'll just, so long as the sun is hot, we, we sit comfortably in the shade. But if we're not wise, if we're restless and want to experience this and that in the world, we go out into the sun, we get scorched, we come back to a shade, and then we go out again and we come back again. 
So someone who acts like this is, is a, not a wise person, a foolish person, a person who lacks uh, judgment. Uh, and in the next sentence, he says, Anal vivikio nirle vitu ningan. But a viviki, someone who can judge, discriminate, or distinguish, will not depart leaving with shade. So a wise person will not go outside and uh, suffer in the sunshine. Apadie uh, means likewise. Nyani in manamam brahmate vitu ningavadile. Likewise, the mind of the jnani, the jnani means someone who is aware of their real nature, but the mind of the jnani will not depart leaving Brahman. Brahman is another term meaning, referring to our real nature, um, which is uh, pure awareness and infinite happiness. Um, <clears throat> here Bhagavan uh, uses the term jnani in manamum, but he's using, um, he's using mind here in a metaphorical sense, because the jnani doesn't have a mind. But what he means is the jnani's attention never leaves his real nature, never leaves Brahman. So the, the, jnani, is, uh, the jnani is completely absorbed in Brahman. In fact, the jnani is nothing but Brahman himself, but Brahman itself. But the jnani, we, because we mistake ourselves to be a body, we mistake the jnani to be a body. We think Bhagavan was a body who a person who lived for 54 years in Tiruvannamalai gave us all these teachings and everything, but that, that is not Bhagavan's real nature. That's only in our view he seems to be a person. Actually what Bhagavan is, is Brahman itself. Bhagavan often used to say, Jnana me Jnani, that is Jnana itself is the Jnani. That is Jnana in that context means pure self-awareness is the Jnani. So, the, the jnani is nothing other than pure awareness, but he is speaking, coming, speaking in a in a ordinary way. He said the mind of the jnani never leaves Brahman. So though it seems to us that Bhagavan um, Bhagavan is interacting with the world, seeing the world, responding to questions that he's asked, and and just uh, behaving like any other person, that is. Bhagavan, but that Bhagavan exists only in our view. The real Bhagavan, that is behind that appearance, is nothing but Brahman, which never, never comes out at all. It always remains as it is. But he, uh, what he says here is, likewise, the mind of a jnani uh, will not depart leaving Brahman. Anal agnani in manamo prapanjitil uh, Urandru uh, uh, Dukkha Paduvadum Siridu Nerum Brahmatiku Tirumbi Sukum Adevadum Mai uh, Irakiradu. But the mind of the Agnani, that's a person who is not aware of burial nature, remains experiencing Dukkha by roaming about in the world and for a short while obtaining Sukha by returning to Brahman. How do we return to Brahman? We return to Brahman every night when we go to sleep. Even when we experience a little pleasure here and there by eating a nice tasty chocolate or um, getting something that we want or meeting a friend we haven't seen for a long time, we feel happy. That happiness is nothing but Brahman. So we, to that, to, when, we, whenever we experience any type of happiness, whatever it seems to us the happiness may come from outside, but actually the happiness is only from within, and that happiness is Brahman. That is our real nature. And and then in the um, he then in the next um, uh, three sentences he concludes this paragraph. When he, he in this in the, next, in the next sentence he says Jagam Embadu Nineve, what is called the world is only thought. The world means all the phenomena that seem to exist outside us. The tables, the chairs, the windows, the sky, the moon, the sun, uh, the houses, all these things, all these ex phenomena that seem to exist outside ourselves. That is what we call world. But it's nothing. Bhagavan says in, um, in Uludunapdu, in the uh, sixth, verse, sixth verse of Uludunapdu, 
the world is nothing but five types of sense experience. It, what, what we take to be the world is nothing but a combination of sights, sounds, tastes, tactile sensations, and um, smells. These five types of sense, sense, um, sensory experience, these together combine to make what we call the world. The Bhagavan said this world is actually nothing but thought. We can understand this by considering the world we experience in a dream. In a dream, we experience ourselves as a body, and we also experience a dream. And we also experience a, a world that seems to exist outside ourselves. But as soon as we wake up, we recognize that, that all that we experienced in the dream was nothing but our, a figment of our own imagination. It was all our own mental projection. So it was what we took to be physical phenomena in a dream were actually only mental phenomena. So all the things that seemed to exist outside us were actually just thoughts in our own mind. They were just mental phenomena. And according to Bhagavan, this, our present state is nothing but a, dream, but a dream. In fact, any state in which we experience phenomena of any kind whatsoever is just a dream. So whatever world we may perceive, whether it's this world or heaven or hell or the world in a dream, any world is nothing but our own mental projection, our own, it's nothing but thoughts or mental phenomena. So Jagamembadu Nimevi, what is called the world is only thought. Um, and then in the next sentence he says, Jagam Marayam Podu, Adavadu, Nenevatra Podu, Manam Anandate Anubhavi Kindradu. Uh, that means when the world uh, disappears, uh, and then he explains that because he had said in the previous sentence that the world is nothing but thoughts, he says that is when thoughts uh, cease, manam uh, anandate anubhavi kindradu. The world, the mind experiences happiness. So when the, uh, whenever the world disappears, in other words, when all thoughts cease, as in sleep, we experience happiness. Jagam tondrum podu adu dukate anubhavikindradu. When the world appears, it, meaning the mind, experiences dukkha, experiences dissatisfaction or suffering. So in waking and dream, we are never fully satisfied. We experience full satisfaction, full happiness only in sleep. Because in waking and dream, the, the mind has risen, and along with the mind or, mind or ego can arise only by experiencing itself as a body. And the body is obviously part of a world. So whenever ego rises, a world appears along with it. And so whenever the world appears, the mind or ego experiences dukkha, dissatisfaction. So the... Uh, that's the end of this paragraph, but the sum and substance of all this is when our attention goes outwards towards the world, goes, when our t attention leaves ourselves and is directed towards any phenomena of any kind whatsoever, we experience dukkha, dissatisfaction. When our attention turns back, we turn our back on the world, we ignore all phenomena and attend only to ourselves, then we experience happiness. So Bhagavan, what is, the goal Bhagavan wants us to achieve is happiness, infinite happiness. And the way to achieve that is to experience happiness. How do we experience happiness? By turning away from the world and turning our attention back towards ourselves. World means not only the, uh, along with all these external phenomena, there's also all the thoughts in, in, in our mind. In some places, Bhagavan refers to thought, worlds inside and outside just like there's this seemingly physical world that seems to exist outside we also experience a world of our own thoughts in our mind so all so when Bhagavan uses this word jagam meaning world he's referring to all phenomena both the phenomena that seem to be physical uh, and the phenomena that seem to be mental so both are not not only the, the physical phenomena of the world but also the mental phenomena, the thoughts, feelings, emotions, likes, dislikes, everything. All, all phenomena, 
we, he, we can club together under the term jagon. So when the when this when when phenomena of any kind whatsoever appear, we experience dissatisfaction. When all phenomena disappear, that's when all thought ceases, we experience happiness. So Bhagavan wants us to be happy. He says that we, rather than carrying our small luggage on our head, we should put it aside and uh, travel happily in the train. So the more we surrender ourselves, um, the more we, 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 we surrender, that means giving up all our likes and dislikes and giving up even the liking to rise as an ego. The more we, uh, the more we are able to surrender ourselves, the happier we will be, the more contented we will be. So if, if, we, if, um, if we are a true, true devotees of Bhagavan, that's the sign of a true devotee of Bhagavan is being happy. Being, it doesn't matter what happens. We all undergo so many experiences in life. We undergo pleasant experiences. We undergo unpleasant experiences. We have loved ones. We lose our loved ones. Death comes to all, all of us sooner or later. And in the course of life, so many of our, those people we love uh, go before us. But in the, all these things, it's all part of a dream. So if we, if we are truly surrendering ourselves, if we truly accept whatever happens as the will of Bhagavan for our own spiritual benefit, we'll be happy in the midst of all the misery of the world. I mean, the nature of the world is misery. Bhagavan says, when the world experience, when the world appears, the mind experiences misery. But the more we surrender ourselves, the more we, the less, um, the less weight we give the world, the less important we give to the world, the less important we give to our, ourself as a person, the happier we will be. Okay, it's we all know in this life we have to go through pleasant and unpleasant experiences, but if we accept these as the sweet will of Bhagavan given to us for our own spiritual benefit, we can find happiness underlying even the most miserable experiences of life. Even the, one of the greatest sadnesses of life is when someone very dear to us is uh, the, um, when their life comes to an end. We all experience such bereavement sooner or later. And, but even in the midst of that, we should find joy because all nothing actually is ever lost or gained because what actually exists is only the infinite happiness that is our own real nature. So all, our, all those people we love are nothing but our own real nature. So they never actually leave us. They're always with us. But we, instead of seeing them outside, we can have to turn within to see them as they actually are, which is our own real nature. So we, if we truly want to follow Bhagavan's path, we have to, we have to, um, we have to be, instead of seeking happiness outside ourselves, we have to seek it within ourselves. We have to see all that, all that we love outside actually comes from within. So if we want to experience the, full happiness, the full joy of love, we have to turn within. Because that is infinite happiness and infinite love is our real nature. So Bhagavan only asks one thing of us. He doesn't ask us anything else. He just asks us to be happy. But how to be happy in the midst of all this misery of life? By turning within, by surrendering to him. Michael, would you like to take a 10 minute break while we do some No, no, no. We can continue with questions and then have, our, um, have the usual break. Okay. I think so, we usually, oh, do, oh, wait a second. I'm forgetting, I'm forgetting what our usual routine is. We, have a, we usually have 10 minutes after I finish talking, is it? Yes, we can do it that way or we can have questions immediately, whatever you'd prefer. Um, I think um, I would prefer to, to continue with questions now. And then when we have a break, I can go down and uh, we can decide when we're going to uh, start again. And I'll be back up for that. Okay, we'll do that. So uh, if anybody wants to ask a question, would you like to come and sit here? 
and uh, speak to Michael. Sorry, when when I'm there in person, you can sit wherever you are and ask, but I'll probably hear you clearly only if you're quite near to the PC. That's why we're asking you to come up to the front if you want to ask anything. Anyone, Anyone? be brave and come and yes. sit here. All right. Yeah. Um, I want to stay here. Can you see me okay? Yeah, yeah, I can see you fine. Well, you can sit in the chair, whatever. <laughs> Quick question. Okay. <laughs> um, this this part of uh, who am I seems to be more about um, surrendering the self. Yes. Is that a separate uh, practice to self inquiry? Or no, is it no, 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 no. Um, well, you you can say surrender. We, we can surrender ourselves long before we come to a path of self-investigation, but we can only surrender ourselves partially. It, most religions, you will find surrender is actually the, the underlying practice of most types of spiritual practice. Whether you're a Christian or a Muslim or a Buddhist or a Hindu or Jain or whatever, yielding oneself, giving oneself up, it's expressed differently in different religions, but self-surrender is fundamental to any type of spiritual practice. But when we, when we in, in the early stages of self-surrender, we are trying to surrender our will to God. Like in, in the Christian prayer, thy will be done. Bhagavan has also sung to our natural, your will is my will, that itself is my happiness. So we are surrendering our will to the will of God or whatever. What I mean, some people uh, think in terms of God, or if you don't have a particularly um, theistic view of the world, we can you can say accepting things as they are. Because we can't actually change. We think we can change things in the world. We think we can obtain happiness by doing that, this and that. But actually, things happen as they're meant to happen. We cannot, we, the, 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 the feeling that we have of people say they want to be in control. But what are we in control of? So many things happen in life that we have no control over at all. Things happen to us. And accepting these things giving up our likes and dislikes, accepting, finding contentment and satisfaction just as in things as they are. This is the beginning of the path of surrender. So surrender begins by giving up our likes and our dislikes, our desires, our hopes, our fears. In other words, surrendering our will. But we can never completely surrender our will without surrendering the one who has the will, that is, their will is the ego's will. It, as ego, but we have likes and dislikes, hopes and fears. Uh, uh, Michael, so, can you repeat that? It's just one okay. sentence. Okay, so I said, it, as, as he, it is the, the root of all desire, all, all the root, but that is, the, the root of the will in all its forms is ego. Because it's ego who has likes, it's ego who has dislikes, ego who has hopes, fears, desires, attachments, all, all these things are only for ego. So, so long as ego is there, we cannot be completely without likes and dislikes. We cannot be completely without desire because desire is the very nature of ego. So in order to give up, in order to surrender our will completely, we have to surrender the one who has the will. That is why it's called self-surrender. And what is the self we have to surrender? Obviously, we cannot surrender our real nature. We cannot surrender what we actually are. We can only surrender what we seem to be. So it's ego that has to be surrendered. How to surrender ego? Bhagavan has, has taught us what is the nature of ego. Ego rises by being aware of things other than itself. When it turns its attention back to itself, it subsides. So the only way to, to, um, to uh, achieve complete surrender, to surrender ourselves entirely, is to turn our attention within. That's why in the 
13th paragraph of um, the previous paragraph we talked last month, the very first sentence, Bhagavan says, Anma chintane tavira, vera chintane kalamburdhku satram idam kodamo, apmanishta paranai iripte, tanne isanaku alipadam. That means uh, being, uh, being as one who is firmly established as oneself, that's apmanishta paranai iripte, um, um, Atma chintane tavira, ver chintane kalambaradaku satram idam kodamo. Without giving uh, the slightest room to the rising of any thought, ababan atma chintana. Atma chintana literally means thought of oneself, but in effect it means self attentiveness. So turning our attention back towards ourselves, when we at if we attend only to ourselves, there's no room for any thoughts to arise. The thoughts arise only when we give room in our in our awareness for them to arise but if our whole attention is focused on us self then there's no room for any thoughts to arise um so so but when in that sentence he said what in effect he says in that sentence that in order to surrender yourself completely you have to uh, turn your attention back towards yourself so in in the final stages the, uh, that is the culmination of the path of surrender is the path of self-investigation. The surrender can become complete only by means of self-investigation. Because it's only when we investigate this ego that it subsides and disappears. So we can... Uh, uh, the, the early stages of, uh, of self-surrender can go on independent of self-investigation. But the further we go along the, I mean, to, to, to advance far along the path of surrender, we have to take to the, um, to the, uh, to, um, to this path of self-investigation. And likewise, we cannot truly, without surrendering, we cannot follow this path of self-investigation. Because our desires and attachments makes us cling to things other than ourselves. So in order, and until we are already cultivated that that willingness to let go we cannot even begin to follow this path of self-investigation because we have to be willing to let go of everything else in order to cling firmly to ourself alone so they're just two sides of the same coin inseparable does that adequately answer your question <laughs> Hello. <laughs> um, basically, as I see it, this world is unique to me. Yes. In it's fact, your dream. All these people. Yes. My dream. Yes. So, um, including. Bhagavad. Yes. So the object of the exercise yes. is to establish that this form yes. is a fraud. Is a what? A fraud. A fraud, fraud, yes, yes. You we are cheating ourselves. By taking ourselves to be a body, we are cheating ourselves. Yes. Is looking at this form. Uh, no, because when we look within, we are turning our attention away from... What we are investigating is ego. Ego is neither what we actually are, it's not our real nature, which is pure awareness, nor is it this body. Ego is the spurious entity that rises between these two, so to speak, taking on the properties both of the awareness and of the body and combining these together. That's why Bhagavan calls it Chit Jada Granti. Chit means pure awareness. Jada means what is non-aware. This body is, is just uh, insentient matter. 
But we take, we think, I am this body, I am aware. So as if this body is aware. So we are mixing these two together. Chit Jada Granti, Granti means not. So if you take two pieces of string and tangle them together, they get into a tight tangled knot. That, that knot is not one piece of string or the other piece of string. It's the, it's the confused mixture of the two, the tangled mixture of the two. So ego is not this body, is not the pure awareness, but it is the false awareness that experiences itself as I am this body. So the, the path of self-investigation is to distinguish ourselves from this body. So when we, when we are investigating ourselves, we're not investigating the body, we're ex investigating that I which says I am this body. The I which says I am this body is not this body, because the same I that now says I am this body, in dream it says I am some other body. So there's another element. So Mary is innocent, but the guilty party is the one who says I am Mary. The one who sees this world. Right. So Mary exists, but she's in dream. She just, like you said, all these other people exist in your dream. Mary exists in your dream just as much as, all, as Michael and all these other people. Yeah, but, but you're part of my dream. You don't exist. I'm not part of Mary's dream. Mary is part of your dream. I, this, this person, Michael, and Mary are both part of the dreamer's dream. But, but the dreamer always sees the dream world from the perspective of one body. Doesn't matter which body, somebody it takes, and it's from the perspective of that body that it sees the world. But the dreamer is not the body. In dream, we experience ourselves as if we're a body. And we see the whole world from the, the dream world from the perspective of that body. But when we wake up, we know that dream body was just a figment of our imagination. So we should never confuse ego with the person that ego mistakes itself to be. In fact, that is the nature of ego. Ego is that confused awareness, I am this person. I am Mary. But ego is not Mary. So what you need to investigate is ego. Forget about Mary. Leave Mary aside for a while. She's been troubling you for long enough. <laughs> but, but, but actually, Mary is innocent. The problem is, it's not Mary who came and caught hold of you. It's you who caught hold of Mary and said, I am Mary. So I am, in fact, distinct from, from Mary. Yes. From ego. Um, yes. Yes. But this ego, it, it cannot stand alone. It cannot stand without attaching itself to a person, without projecting and attaching itself to a person. So when you investigate this ego, you're turning, you're ignoring Mary, you're ignoring, ignoring all the five sheaths, the, the physical body, the life, the, the mind, the intellect, the will, you're ignoring all these things, and you're clinging just to the eye. Since you're- um, Michael, just, just repeat up, yourself. Uh, Michael, just repeat yourself, the look, last- you're, so, you're clinging just to the eye. That is, I, I am clinging to myself. The eye is clinging to itself. It's, uh, when it clings only to itself, it's letting go of all other things. So in that way, you separate yourself from Mary. And when ego is separated from everything else, it is no longer ego. It is your real nature, pure awareness. Right. So there's another element apart, apart from the form. Yes. The ego, the ego rises by grasping a form as itself. Right. Without so, grasping a form, it cannot stand. So if it, instead, of try, instead of grasping any form, if it tries to, ego is formless. If it tries to grasp itself and thereby lets go of all other forms, it dissolves back into its source. And what remains is pure self-awareness, which is what you really are. So when you find out what the ego is there is no such thing it disappears it yes no it, it's like it's like like a rope and a snake so long as you see a, see it as a as a snake it's frightening and you think how can i get rid of this snake it's i'm not able to go along this path because the snake's still in my way you take a stick and you beat it but it still doesn't show any sign of being dead so how do you kill it 
you have to look at it very carefully. When you look at it very carefully, what do you see? Just a rope. When you see what it actually is, the snake is disappears. Likewise, when we see what we actually are, ego disappears. Because ego is not what we actually are. It's a mistaken identification. One final, final point. From yes. The dream is not common to all, is it? Sorry? My dream is yes. not common to all. What I am seeing is me. It's my dream. Yes. These good people are not seeing the same dream. No, no person is seeing a dream. Ah. Right? What sees the dream is the one ego. Who is that one ego? The one who is seeing the dream. No, I think my brain hurts. <laughs> <laughs> well, Michael, Mary, Mary is as much a part of the dream as all these other people. It's not Mary's dream. Mary is a is part of the dream. It just so happens that Mary is the, the person from whom, whose perspective ego is seeing the world. You are, you are ego. You are the one ego who is seeing the world. You happen to be seeing, today, today you, are, you happen to be seeing the world from the perspective of Mary. Tomorrow, who knows, you may wake up as someone else. But neither Mary nor that other person is who you actually are. Right, that's a that's, that's yeah. Even this ego, even the one who sees this world is not what you actually are. But you have to go deep into this investigation to see that. And you have to, first you have to let go of Mary. So long as you're clinging to Mary, it's ego. When ego, when you turn, when ego turns its attention so keenly on itself that it lets go of the person that it seems to be, then it dissolves back into its source. Then it is found to be nothing but a rope, but pure awareness. The snake is found to be just a rope. There never was a snake there. It was only a rope. Likewise, there never was an ego. There was only pure awareness. But in order to see that, we have to look at it very carefully. You've given me a lot to think about there. I better leave it to somebody no, else. never gives us a lot to think about. He gives us just one thing to think about. That is I. Think about I. Forget everything else. Yes. Right. All, everything else, all the rest of Bhagavan's teaching is only to impress upon us the need to think only of I. That's why that first sentence of the 13th paragraph, which I was just talking about earlier, he begins by saying, Atma Chintane Tavira, accept the thought of oneself, not giving room to any other thought. That is, give, that is surrendering oneself. So if you want to surrender yourself, think only of yourself. Don't think of anything else. Right, thanks, Michael. I'll <laughs> leave it to somebody else. So, think, thinking of a lot of thinking of is a is a lot of hard work, isn't it? It is. So Bowen doesn't want us to tax ourselves by thinking. So he he simply he gives us the simplest possible teachings to impress upon us the need, but we don't have to think of anything other than ourselves. Right, okay. Who am I? Who am I? That's it. That's the beginning and the end of it. I wish. <laughs> it's certainly the end. It's certainly the end. But we haven't yet come to the end. <laughs> and it was also the beginning. Because there's nowhere else to begin or to end. Um, Michael, before we break up, um, yeah. break and give you a break as well. Yes. Yeah clarification on this and I think it might be to do with the use of words when we say ego are we sort of talking about the mind which is to say that um, as you were saying the world which we see is um, and what we think we are and so on is through our senses and our thoughts yes right and uh, the idea of the ego and if we think of all the senses um, as thought uh, yes. obviously as thought then all of this in, in one word, perhaps a word which is easier for people to, for everybody to understand, would that be mind or something of the sort? Yes. Because I'm 
ego, we're not really sure what it means. Well, the, the, yes, but the problem with using the word mind is... I, mind. I think that's just going around in circles in a way. Yeah, yeah. No, the, the, the problem with using the term mind, I mean, Bhagavan often uses the term mind in this context, but mind has, has different meanings in different places. For example, when he says the mind of Vanyani never leaves Brahman, but the mind of Yagnyani leaves Brahman, what he means by mind in that context is attention. And in another sentence in the 16th paragraph, he de defines what is self-investigation, Atma Vichara, by saying, uh, always keeping the mind fixed in, uh, in Atman, in oneself. So their mind he's using in the sense of attention. We also use the term mind as a collective term for all thoughts. So in the 18th verse of uh, verse 18 of Upadeshundia, Bhagavan says, Enangale manam, the mind is only thoughts, or th only thoughts of the mind. But there are so many thoughts in the mind. Of all those thoughts, the thought I is the root. So generally when Bhagavan is talking about mind, he's talking about that root thought I. That is, mind consists of two parts, we can say, the perceiver and the perceived. Because all thoughts are part of the mind. The whole world, Bhagavan says, is nothing but thoughts. So everything that we perceive, they're all our thoughts. But they are the perceived part of the mind. They're the object. But the ego is the subject. The, that element of the mind which perceives all the other elements, that is what Bhagavan calls the thought called I, the I thought. That is ego. So often Bhagavan uses the term mind as a, as a, uh, in the sense of ego, as a, in the, to, to refer to that, because what is the essential element of the mind? No other thought can stand by itself. It must, there must be a perceiver. In order to, for a, a thought to exist, it must be perceived. Who is perceiving the thought? That is ego. So the perceiver, the subject, is ego, or everything else is phenomena. Collectively, they all make up the totality of mind, but the essence of the mind, the root of the mind, is only this ego, the perceiver. That I is, Drishya Vivaka, we have to distinguish the perceiver from what is perceived. That is why I was impressing on Mary, the person we've mistaken, now I feel I am Michael, and Michael is talking, Michael is doing this, and I say, I'm doing this, I'm sitting here, I'm talking, I'm thinking, all these things. I'm identifying myself with phenomena, because Michael is just one of the phenomena. It happens to be the phenomena, the phenomenon from, from the perspective of which I am seeing all other phenomena, but it's still a phenomena. This body is an object. I am the subject who is aware of this. So when we investigate ourselves, it's the subject we have to investigate. The one, the perceiver of all these things. That's why Bhagavan says, see the seer. Ignore what is seen, see the seer. So the seer is ego. But when the seer sees itself, it ceases to be ego and remains as pure self-awareness, which is our real nature. Uh, Michael, I think uh, when we come back, we'll, uh, I think we need to go, I think we need to unpack this notion of the I thought and the ego, because I think it would. Well, this is, this, is the very, this, is the very, this is the very cornerstone of Bhagavan's teachings, because so, the whole, this, yeah. is, this is the part of self-investigation. We need, yeah, to, we need, need to, to make it really yes. sort of tangible to people. Well, well. The, the, the thing is, we, this is something, this is an investigation we have to, I mean, by all means we'll discuss it, but ultimately we need to dis make this, we need to, this is Viveka, Viveka is distinguishing, we need to distinguish the victory of Viveka, distinguish the, the perceiver from the perceived. So this is what the whole of this path of self-investigation is about. And also, we have to surrender ourselves. If we're on the path of surrender, we have to surrender ourselves. If we don't know what it is we're trying to surrender, we'll always be surrendering something other than ourselves. If we want to surrender ourselves, we have to know ourselves. So, the, this, 
understanding the nature of ego and clearly, clearly understanding the ego is not anything perceived. It is only the perceiver. That is very, very fundamental. So by all means, we'll, we'll continue this discussion afterwards. This is the most important part of Bhagavad. I mean, this is the very crux of Bhagavan's teachings. Yes, I think ego, is, ego or I thought, whatever it's called, is the very center point of Bhagavan's teachings. But that is the Chit Jaragranti, that is the knot that we've got ourselves tied up in. So we have to distinguish the Chit from the Jada. That process of distinguishing the Chit from the Jada, giving up the Jada, that is self surrender and self investigation, one and the same. So we'll come back to it after the break, Michael. After Thank the break, you. yes. Well. So you wanted to continue uh, asking about um, ego, I thought. Yes, I think uh, everybody wants a clarification of that. Yes. Hands up. I think everybody wants a mm. clarification. So clarification in very uh, simple terms, which uh, people can understand in terms of their own experience, so they can work on it directly without feeling it's just words. Okay. So that's um, what we need, which is very well, I'll, I'll just briefly say what, what Bhagavan says in, um, there are four verses of Uludhanapadu, but um, in which Bhagavan um, talks about ego. Um, mm. I, I, what, what he says in those verses uh, is, is very relevant to understanding what exactly ego is. Uh, in verse 23, he begins by saying, um, but since it is um, since it is uh, um, w without awareness, since it is devoid of awareness, the body doesn't say I. And nobody says, um, um, in sleep I do not exist. That in waking, no, no, we 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 all know that we exist in sleep. In other words. In, I'm not talking about in sleep. In waking, we all recognize that we exist in sleep. So we don't say, uh, I, I, did, I cease to exist in sleep. Um, he, he says this for two reasons. Firstly, the, the body, and by body, he doesn't just mean the uh, physical body. He says in earlier in verse 5 of Urunapti, he says, Udul Panchakosa Uru. The body is a form of five sheaths. Therefore, all five are included in the term body. The five sheaths are, in very simple terms, the physical form, the physical body, the prana, which is the life, the mind, the intellect, and the will. These five together constitute body. It's also what, what we commonly call a person. When we talk about a person, we are not just taught, I mean, a person is a body, but a person also has other characteristics, which are not, it's not just the physical characteristics that make up the person. It's also the, the, the mental and emotional characteristics. So all these, uh, uh, all these five, that is the, the body, the life, the mind, the intellect and the will, this all makes up what a person is. So this is what Bhagavan means by the term body. Um, so he said, the body doesn't say I, because it's devoid of awareness. That is, according to Bhagavad, all these five sheaths are devoid of awareness. Here, uh, one of the five sheaths, the third one, is the Manomaya Kosha, the sheath composed of mind. But here, we were talking earlier about the term mind, it's used in different sense, in different contexts. So in terms of the, the sheath, the one of the uh, five coverings, um, the the mind means all the all, all thoughts, everything, all the objective elements of the mind, um, but not the intellect and the will, which are, I mean, together they all form the mind, but the, the thoughts, the feelings, the emotions, the perceptions, that all makes up manamaya kosha. The, um, the vijnanamaya kosha, the intellect, is that part of the mind which uh, judges and distinguishes and uh, reasons and the will is all the desires, hopes, likes, dislikes, fears and so on. 
Um, so all these together make up what Bhagavan refers to as body, and these are all jada. They're all devoid of awareness. Um, so it, it's not it's not these these this body consisting of these five sheets that says I. And we know that in sleep we are not uh, we don't cease to exist in sleep. So I continues in sleep. And then he says, after an eye rises, everything rises. The eye that rises is he's referring to that to ego, but he doesn't specify it in that verse. And he concludes that verse by saying, therefore, investigate with a uh, with a keen mind where this eye rises. Then in the next verse, he again says the first sentence, he says, um, uh, Jada Urul Nan Enadu. That means the, this insentient body does not say I. When he says does not say I, it, it's a metaphorical way of saying it's not aware of itself as I. So it's, the, the, the body is not aware of itself as I. And then he says, Satchit Udiyadu. Satchit means being awareness or the real awareness doesn't rise, it just is. But between these two rises an I of the me to the measure of the body. What he means by to the measure of the body, when we rise as ego, we feel we are limited in time and space. We are limited within the conf confines of this body in terms of space. And in terms of time, we, we are confined within the lifespan of this body. So we, within these limits of the body, this I rises. In other words, I is identifying, or well, he doesn't even say within the limit, he says as the limit of the body. So in other words, it's as this body, but the I rises with all the limitations that go with the body. Um, so um, what this means is this, and then he says in the next sentence, this, referring to this I that rises between the, uh, the, the Jada body and, the, um, and Satchit, uh, this is Chit Jada Granti, but not between um, consciousness and what is insentient. Uh, um, uh, I, um, I can't remember. He, could, he says bondage, samsara, ego, mind, um, subtle body, uh, and jiva. So this is all the all these terms refer to that. So this is this is very very important because what he's saying here is what is what says what is aware of itself as I is not the body, and. Uh, the the real awareness doesn't appear or disappear; it just remains as it is. But between these two, a false awareness rises as I am this body. So this false awareness, I am this body. It is not the body, and it's not Satchit. It is some spurious entity that rises between the two, and partakes of the qualities of both. Like Satchit, it is aware. But whereas Satchit is just aware of it itself, it's not aware of anything else because Satchit is the infinite whole. So Satchit is not aware of phenomena, but this ego is a type of awareness, but it's not a real awareness because it's, it's the awareness that is aware of phenomena. Not only is it aware of phenomena, it's aware of itself as one of those phenomena, namely a body, from the perspective of which it uh, perceives all other. Uh, phenomena. Um, so this is ego. It is. It is not the real awareness. It is not the. It is not any of the adjuncts. The the body, mind, intellect, will, or any of these things. It is some spurious entity that rises between these and identifies itself. But such it is just the pure awareness. I am. The body is not aware at all. But between these two, this, this spurious awareness, I am this body. Whereas the Satchit is, is not aware of itself as I am this or that. It's aware of itself just as I am. Ego is always aware of itself as I am this body. It always experiences itself as a body. The body changes. So the ego is not the body because in waking state it experiences this body as I. In dream it experiences itself as some other body. When this body dies, 
uh, it'll it'll project some other body and experience that as I. So it's not the ego is not any of the bodies. The bodies come and go. The ego is a is a more constant factor. E even ego is not permanent because it disappears every day in sleep. It's that it's that false awareness I that rises in waking and dream, and always experiences itself as a body and consequently experiences other phenomena. So ego is the subject, the perceiver. All the body and all other phenomena are things perceived. So though the ego experiences itself as if it's this body, it is not this body. It is that which is aware of itself as I am this body. People sometimes say, um, then if, um, if, we, if Bhagavan tells us we have to investigate this I, and if he says this I is I am a body, does that mean we, we also have to uh, investigate the body or attend to the body? No, ego is not the body. It's that, it's that awareness that mistakes itself to be a body. So to distinguish the ego, to distinguish the ego from the body is very important. And remember, the body doesn't just mean the physical form. It includes the, the life, the mind, the intellect, and the will. So ego is not anything that is perceived. It is the perceiver. It is not an object, it's the subject. It's, it's not the drissia, it's the drick. So, uh, um, and then in the next verse, the, the, uh, verse 25, he says more about it. He did, in verse 25, he refers to it as Uruvatrapeyahande. It's a, it's a formless phantom ego. So when he says it's a formless phantom, that means it has no form of its own. But though it has no form of its own, it seems to exist. It comes into seeming existence by grasping a form. So he says, Urupatriundam, um, grasping form, it comes into existence. Urupatri nikkum, grasping form, it stands. Urupatri undu mika ongum. Gras grasping and um, and feeding on forms, it it flourishes, uh, it flourishes abundantly. Make um, <coughs> Uruvitu urupatu. Leaving one form, it grasps another form. Tadinal um, when in, when sought, when investigated, it disappears. So, what Bhagavan is saying here, the ego is not any form. But the body, all the five sheaths are forms. Uh, but the ego is not this form consisting of these five. It's not any form at all. It's a formless phantom. But it seems to exist by grasping form. What does he mean by grasping form? How does the ego, this formless phantom, grasp form? It grasps forms in its awareness. The, the, the ego attaches itself by attending to things. So the first form it grasps is the form of a body. And it holds on to that form in order to be aware of all other forms. When he talks of it uh, grasping and feeding on forms, he's talking about it, it, its attention is jumping from one phenomena to another. Whether, whether that phenomena is a physical, uh, the, the seemingly physical phenomena of the world or the seemingly mental phenomena, I mean the, the mental phenomena that uh, seem to be within the mind. All these are, according to Bhagavan, they're all mental phenomena, and all phenomena are, th are forms. So the ego is not a phenomenon, it, it's not any of the things that it is aware of. The, but ego doesn't actually have any real existence. It seems to exist only when we're looking elsewhere, only when we're looking at other things. Bhagavan sometimes used to say, uh, a ghost, if, if you're walking along a dark path and you um, and you mistake the trees or the moonlight to be a ghost. But the ghost uh, seems to exist only when you don't look at it carefully enough. When you're looking elsewhere, there seem to be ghosts all around. But when you look at carefully at, at the ghost, it, it, there's no such thing. The ghost doesn't actually exist. It seems to exist when, only when we don't look at it carefully enough. So this ego seems to exist only when we're attending to other things. If we look very carefully at the ego, there's no such thing. That's why he says, Tadinal Opum Pidicum. If sought, it takes flight. 
So the ego is not this or that. In fact, the ego is nothing at all. But only in the next verse, he says, when a hande undain and etum undain. If this ego comes into existence, everything comes into existence. Uh, a hande in drill, indra and etum. If the ego doesn't exist, everything doesn't exist. So the ego is the, is the root, source, and foundation of all phenomena. That's why he says in the next sentence of verse 26, he says, Ahande yavama, ego is everything. But though he says everything is ego, he, what he means is ego is the seed that expands as all these things. So all, all, all phenomena are nothing but thoughts, they're mental phenomena. And what is the source of all mental phenomena? The thinker of all thoughts. Who is the thinker? Ego. So that which is aware of all phenomena is the is is all these phenomena we perceive, they appear they appear from within us. So it, it, the ego is the base of all these phenomena. So he says the ego itself is everything. There's no everything, there's no phenomena without ego. Ego is the is the seed and foundation of all phenomena. Uh, therefore, and then, he, then he said, therefore, investigating what it is, is giving up everything. Why does he say that? Because if we investigate it, it disappears. When ego disappears, everything disappears. So if we want to, if we want to renounce everything, there's no use in going and sitting in a cave in the Himalayas. If it's our destiny, it may happen, but the, that is not the real renunciation. According to Bhagavan, real renunciation is renunciation of ego. Because when we renounce ego, we give up everything. That is the renunciation that is required. A, any other renunciation is, 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 is far, far from perfect renunciation. And it's the, uh, the outward renunciation is not necessarily solving any problems. If it's beneficial for us to live a life of, a, of outward renunciation, it will, our destiny will be according will uh, be shaped accordingly. But that is, that's not, you don't become spiritual by changing your clothes or changing your name or shaving your head or any such thing. It's by renouncing the ego that we become spiritual. Um, well, we, we don't become spiritual. We, we become, we become, well, we remain as the spirit that we always have been. So, so ego is, is not any phenomena, it's nothing perceived, it is what perceives them. And it's not the reality, because the reality, reality is aware, the reality is infinite awareness. That which is infinite can, cannot be, uh, they, there can't be anything other than what is infinite. Because if there's something other, the infinite would be thereby be limited and it wouldn't be infinite, it would be finite. So the, the, our real nature is infinite awareness, infinite happiness, infinite being. That is not aware of any other, because it's also undivided. So there, there, there cannot be anything other than it, outside of it. There can't also be anything within it. It is just the one uh, indivisible whole, immutable whole. So pure awareness, which is Brahman or Atmasarupa or whatever we call it, our real nature, is is neither uh, is neither um, is never aware of anything other than itself. That which is aware of phenomena is only ego. So ego is the root of everything. That's why Bhagavan says if ego comes into existence, everything comes into existence. So though he says in that verse 26 that ego itself is everything. He means that in the sense of it's the seed that becomes everything. It's the, it's that, it's, it's the, the, that which expands as all other things. But in order to go back to our source, the, 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 root, the root of all these phenomena is ego. So it's only through ego that we can go back to our source, so to speak. So it's only by withdrawing our attention from all phenomena and focusing it on that which is aware of all phenomena. That the perceiver, focusing our attention on the perceiver, that is investigating ego. And if we focus our attention on ego keenly enough, ego will disappear. Because the more we focus our attention on ego, the more we are withdrawing our attention from everything else. If we, if our attention is one hundred percent focused on ego, then we're not aware of anything else. Because we're aware only of ego. 
But what is ego? It's a formless phantom. What remains is just pure awareness. So um, ego is, is, a, is a spurious entity, but seems to exist only when it's uh, grasping things other than itself. That's only when it's attending to anything other than itself. If it tends to itself, it subsides and disappears. It dissolves back into its source, which is pure, infinite awareness, pure self-awareness. Does that, does that give sufficient clarification or do you want to ask any more questions, uh, Shalini or anyone else? Um, somebody had a question, do you want to come yeah. here? Um, just to, uh, to just uh, before, what's your name, sorry? No, no just before Mel asked the question. Um, so just to make it very simple, we're all sitting here, we're all aware, right? We're all perceivers, we're all aware of something or the other, we're aware yes, that... but though, though we say we're all aware, we're each aware of only one awareness. In a dream, we, we see many people, we assume all those people are perceiving the world just as we are. But when we wake up, we recognize that all those people were our own mental projection. Not only all those people are our own mental projection, even the person we seem to be in the dream is our own mental projection. So the, this person we now mistake ourselves to be is no more real than any other person. And it's not this person who is perceiving the world, it is ego that is perceiving the world. But because ego mistakes itself to be a person, it mistakes every other person to be an ego. So we assume there are many of us here and we're all aware of the world. But we are each actually aware of only one awareness. There is only there is, in a dream. There is actually only one perceiver. But for this, for the because we are having a dialogue, we talk as if we are all aware. But the one who is aware of all this is aware. But they are the one who is aware of it. So sometimes when Bhagavan pointed out, there is only one perceiver, one jiva, one ego. But people ask, but then Bhagavan, who is that one ego? There are so many of us here. Which one is the ego? Bhagavan said, you are that. And someone else said, Bhagavan, what about me? You are that. <laughs> so it, it, but there is one culprit. Among all of us, there's one culprit. That culprit is the one who sees all this. So that culprit knows who they are. Yeah. So... Um... No, I think, it, it, by the way, does everybody feel quite clear about this? A little bit clearer? So, uh, just to clarify, or just once more, for the sake of everybody, would that be a good idea? Okay. So, we're all sitting here. Let's get back to brass tacks. We're all sitting here. We're all feeling aware. Yes. We're all feeling conscious and we're all aware. And we all think, this is me. I think I'm me. Mel thinks she's me. And everybody else thinks, this is me. Right? Mary thought she was me. Uh, but the problem is, isn't thinking I am me. The problem is thinking, I, but this body is me. But this body yeah. is I. <laughs> yeah, the sense of me, right? My thoughts, yeah. my feelings, yeah. Yeah. my everything, right? Everything is me, everything. That's how we live. So we're just here, we're sitting around, and there is a sense that we're aware, and uh, there is a me here. Yeah. So yeah. the problem with this thing called ego is just this awareness which seems to me to be limited to this me. It's just this awareness which I have that I'm this uh, feelings, these thoughts, these, this body, this world. Yeah. This that sense of meanness, which is just this awareness, that limited awareness, that is the ego. Yeah. And that comes up when all these thoughts and feelings and body and mind and everything else comes up. Yeah. And when the thing goes away in a dream, all this, uh, I'm this, I'm this, I'm this, all this awareness of all these things, when that goes away in a dream, that limited awareness, then I'm back to where I started, to the self, to whatever, whatever, whatever. You mean, and then sleep. When, you mean sleep, not dream there. Sorry, in sleep, everybody got yeah. that. When I fall asleep, then that limited sense of my world, my thoughts, just that limited awareness goes away into this deeper awareness, which doesn't have any of these thoughts or uh, any... Yeah sense of bodily form or anything yes. else. So the ego is really that limited awareness, which the sense of limited awareness, which is there. And the way uh, when I'm awake or when I'm in a dream 
And the way to investigate in a way is that just that awareness itself that I'm this or that, I begin to investigate it by meditating, by questioning who am I, whichever way it's done, by saying a mantra, whatever it is anybody wants to do. It's trying to investigate to, through that to go more deeply into that sense of awareness, of that sense of meanness. And then if I work hard enough and with great sincerity, then it's all going to drop away and I shall find that infinite awareness, not just a limited awareness. Yes, as, Bhag as Bhagavan sometimes said, see the seer. Yeah. We, are, we are constantly seeing that we're constantly attending to objects, to things that we perceive, but we never turn our attention back towards the subject. We never try to see the seer. If we try to see the seer, if we focus our attention keen, if the seer sees itself, that if the perceiver perceives it, tries to perceive itself, there's no such thing to be found. So it dissolves back into its source. Can I ask everybody, does everybody feel totally clear? The reason I'm, I'm like this is because I'm a university lecturer, so I have to make sure everybody understands. And I think that's a good idea, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, so I do this all yeah. the time. Well, <laughs> let, 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 can I say, can I say, I'm the first one who doesn't understand. No, 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 but just, no, 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 I'm saying this for a purpose. I appreciate what you're doing and what you're saying, what you're saying is correct, but none of us understand because if we've understood correctly, we would no longer mistake ourselves to be ego. Ego is a confusion. So we are understanding at a certain level, at a certain level of intellect, we're able to understand, but that the understanding is a, is belongs to intellect. We need to go much deeper than intellect. So we need to actually see what we actually are. So we can understand the theory, but it becomes, all this, all this theory becomes clear to the extent we put it into practice. So the more we put it into practice, the more obvious it becomes to us. But I cannot be any of these phenomena. I cannot be this body, this physical form. I cannot be the life. I, I cannot be any of the thoughts that make up the mind. I cannot be that, quality, that judging and discriminating thing called intellect. I cannot be the will. But the will consists of what? It consists of likes, dislikes, desires, hopes, fears, and everything. Who has all these? I have them. But I am not, the, I am not my desire. I have a desire for chocolate. But that desire for chocolate is not me. It is something I have. So we, 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 have, to dis, we have to distinguish, we have to uh, distinguish between that which is aware and all these things we are aware of. So it, 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 it's a matter of, it, it's all a matter of Vivaka, it's all a matter of distinguishing. So ultimately we, we've got to distinguish subject from object. But even, even when we get to subtler and subtler levels, it's even we, we, but what we are trying to distinguish becomes even subtler because there is, there, we're aware of awareness in two forms, in sleep, but awareness we experience is pure awareness. We're not aware of anything, we're just aware. But in waking and dream, we are aware of things. That which is aware of things, the awareness of things is ego. But that is not the real awareness. So we're trying to re, rediscover or, or experience in this waking state the pure awareness that we experienced in dream. So we're trying to distinguish between perceiver and perceived. And then as we get to subtler and subtler levels, what we're trying to distinguish, rather than being distinguishing the perceiver from the perceived, we're trying to, we're trying to distinguish the pure awareness from the perceiving awareness. So, but I mean, I mean it, it, it's, when we put it in words like this, it becomes, all becomes rather gross. What, what these words mean, we discover only by going deeper and deeper and deeper within. And it becomes clearer and clearer, but we are not any of these things. And eventually, when, we, when our attention is focused entirely on ourself, it'll be clear that we're not, we, we're not even this ego. We are just the pure awareness. We are not any, we're not the, any of the pictures on the screen. 
we're not even one perceiving all those pictures. We are just the screen itself. The screen is the pure awareness in which the ego and phenomena appear and disappear. In which perceiver and perceive both appear and disappear. But the root of this, all this show, of perceiver and perceive, is the perceiver. So it's by going, it's by investigating this perceiver, but we get back to the original pure awareness that we actually are. I think that's reasonably clear, everyone, isn't it? Just the awareness yeah, itself. I, I, I think this is just about as clear as words can make it. But merely hearing these words is not sufficient. The, hearing these words is what is called sravana. But we've got to think very deeply about it. But, and, but uh, in order to, to understand it, understand what the, the get deep into the meaning of the words. But the real clarity, I mean, the hearing is necessary. The thinking deeply about it is necessary. But what's most important of all is trying to put it into practice. Because when we are, it's only from the practice that the real clarity comes. You, we can read books about how to ride a bicycle and uh, how to balance, and we can read all these things. But we really can learn how to ride a bicycle only by getting on a bicycle and wobbling and falling off and getting back on and wobbling and falling off. Sooner or later, we find out how to balance. That can be learned only by putting it into practice. So all the, these things we, we read about and we think about and we understand and we say, I've understood it all clearly, it's over, the true clarity comes only yeah. by practice. And that, that, that's not to say that this reading and, uh, and thinking about it is not, it's very, very necessary. But it, that is the beginning. We've got to go deeper and deeper by putting it into practice. And the more we put it into practice, the clearer all of Bhagavan's words will become to us. So should we let Mel ask the question? And Mary, yes. did uh, yes. You were asking, so it's about, yeah, it's about just a quick question about, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, thank you for that explanation. That was yeah. really helpful. Um, I just want to clarify one point that I'm a bit confused about. So, um, if you say, um, that the I am is just aware of itself, yes, uh, when we are turning the attention inwards to investigate that ego so that it can dissipate, yes, that attention is it the ego turning in on itself? Well, e e attention, attention is nothing but a, a selective use of our awareness. We, we, now we're aware of many things. But of all these many things, I can attend to the lights up there, or I can attend to the, a chair, I can attend to this, I can attend to that. We, we, we are a, a, as ego, we are able to select among all the phenomena within our range of perception, we're able to focus on certain things that is so it's, it's the selective use of our awareness ego is that which is aware of phenomena the ego's attention is its selective use of its awareness so it focuses on phenomena now that uh, aware uh, that attention which we usually focus on things other than ourselves we're trying to focus on ourselves so it is the ego focusing on itself yes so it, attention is not it's not something other than the ego. Ego is the, is the awareness that is aware of phenomena. Its ability to focus itself is what is called attention. So attention is nothing other than ego. So attention has to attend to itself rather than attending to anything else. We have to turn the attention back on itself. Turn the ego back on itself. Does that yeah, make it clearer? Yeah. <laughs> words, words can never convey it perfectly because words always have, um, all words have limitations. So the, the words are pointers. We've got, that's why the manana, we're thinking deeply about it to understand what these are pointing at. But the clarity to understand that comes from the practice. So the more we practice, the deeper our, our manana will go, the deeper our, we, the deeper our, reflection on that will become and another reason why the practice is so important what we what we are seeking is clarity the ego is nothing but a confusion 
So to get rid of confusion, we need clarity. But clarity is the, the perfect clarity is pure self-awareness, pure awareness, which is our real nature. E ego is a clouded clarity. In other words, it's, a, it's confused. It's a, it's a, it, it, the ego obscures the clarity, which is our real nature. So we're trying to seek that clarity. The more we turn towards ourselves, because we ourselves are the light, the light to pure awareness that illumines all these things, the more we turn our attention back to ourselves, the, the more clarity we get. And the more clarity we get, the more uh, even the intellectual discrimination becomes sharp and clear. And another reason for this is that our attention, because we're always attending to phenomena, phenomena are relatively gross. One reason why many people find it un difficult to understand what self-investigation is, but they ask, what is it I have to attend to? They, if you say attend only to I, I, I don't know what that, that is. Why, why we initially have this difficulty grasping what self-attention means is because our attention is always on phenomena and because phenomena are gross, our attention has become gross. It's become blunt. Bhagavan sometimes used the analogy of uh, using a blunt crowbar to separate the fine threads, uh, th fine threads of a silk cloth. You need something, you need a very, very sharp needle to be able to separate all those threads. So our power of attention, which has become very blunt and cru uh, clumsy by going always outward, the more we turn it within, the sharper and more refined it becomes. And it's only the very, very sharp and keen uh, power of attention that will be able to focus precisely on what we actually are. Because what we actually are is not, not an object. We're so used to attending to objects, to attending to a subject seems something uh, very, uh, at first it seems something very difficult to grasp. But if we try to, one thing, though it seems difficult for us to grasp, we are always aware of ourselves. So though we are not an object, we're always the center of our awareness. So by, by, tri by trial and error, we slowly, slowly become more and more familiar with what is, what self-attention is. We can learn what self-attention is only by trying to attend to ourself. The more we attend to ourselves, the clearer it will be. But it becomes perfectly, when, we, when we've understood with absolutely clearly what self-attention is, that's the end of the story. Uh, Michael, uh, I think there are a couple more questions and we just have a few more minutes. So what I think we should do is just take the three, uh, two or three questions. Yeah, certainly. If we can answer it shortly. Okay, so uh, uh, there's Mary, there's, uh, sorry, what's your name? Vinita. And there's um, Diana. Three. But, but um, please, I, I, don't want to, I don't want to rush. I mean, I want to, let, let's not try and rush it too much. So higher of the hall. Yeah. So what I would suggest is that we take the three questions together and see if that can be answered succinctly in a few minutes because they usually are very related. So uh, we'll just, uh, so, so, so we're not going to answer it yet, Michael. We'll just Okay, but, but can I say, people ask me a simple question. I give a long, long answer. So if you ask, if you give me three questions, and no, 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 I'll no, try no, to no, make no. Your, this is Michael. going in. <laughs> but I'm going to I'm my person for this. <laughs> We're going to hear these three questions or four yeah. questions. Okay, okay, we'll try. Good question and give it to you. That's a good exercise for me. Uh, yeah, and for all of us. Yes, mine is that concerning the perceiving the perceiver from subject and object. If we reach the subject level, how do we go? Yeah. 
So, okay, so let me get this straight. Okay. So, we're just all stuff the ego, the limited subject, uh, the limited awareness, and how do we turn from that to the real awareness? Yes, the perceiver, the ego, the sense of awareness that you have right now. And then in death, where what's happening? Okay. 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 So Michael, now this is really uh, a skill in summarizing. Okay. So the, the skill in summarizing is this: um, we're this limited false self. We think we're this and that. Uh, the perceiver and the and actually just perceiving the sense of awareness is the perceiver, right? In which I'm thinking you would uh, yeah. that I have that. Okay. The question was: How do we turn from this? Uh, sense of this limited self that I have, this awareness I have of this meaning of the subject, but just let's say awareness, because then, you know, you can actually, it's a bit more tangible, right, rather than receiver and subject. So just this awareness I have that I am this false little thing, uh, how do we go from that to this pure consciousness, the pure okay. self? The, the second question was actually very much related to this, which is, how do I go from this limited uh, awareness, this limited sense of self, this ego, uh, to the towards the real self? How do you go from identifying with the self and becoming real to observing the ego? And what, what method of being okay. there? And, and how do you know that it doesn't exist? Okay, so, uh, yeah, so actually, it's the same question. But it's something <coughs> like this. Uh, I think what Diana is asking is that. Uh, she feels that there is more than one stage here, that we somehow need to become aware of this ego and then to become aware that it doesn't really exist. Well, it, it, doesn't exist but it doesn't really exist, but we think it exists, right? Yeah, so how do you... Yeah, so it's actually the similar question. Yeah, so how do we real, come to realize it doesn't exist? So it's really, you know, the same process, so the same question of going from the limited to the unlimited. Okay. The, then uh, it's, it's, we're not finished yet. That's the amazing thing. And then the last question is that you know when we're going from the limited to the unlimited. So one uh, uh, part of experience, uh, which is of the unlimited, is in sleep, right? And uh, I think what what Mary wants to know is, yes. Yeah, so what's happened to the ego? Okay, so what's happened to the ego in sleep? And then she wants to know what happens to the ego in death. And is it going to grab onto another body? Yeah. Uh, okay. So I don't know okay. how far you're going to get, but... Okay, uh, let, 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 me, let me answer. And um, Michael, I have exactly 10 minutes. Okay, okay. Um, I, I understood the first question in very simple terms. How to go from the... Because I heard that bit, the rest I couldn't hear. I think you asked how to go from the subject to the real self. Forget about the real self. You don't have to worry about the real self. All we need to be concerned about is the subject. If, um, if you investigate and the Michael, subject... Michael, the subject is the ego, right? The subject is the ego, yes. Who is it who is seeing all this? That's all we need to investigate. Because the, the real self, we, we are not... 
it seems to us, but we're not aware of a real self. So let's, let's not to worry about the real self. What we are worried about is this I, but we're now aware of. What is this I? Investigate this I, and what will remain is the real self. This is like saying, um, supposing you're walking along a path in the dark with Bhagavan, and you see a rope, and you see a snake on the path, and you're much afraid. Bhagavan is walking by your side. Bhagavan knows it's not a, a snake, it's only a rope. Bhagavan tells you it's not a snake, it's only a rope. But to you, it looks very much like a snake, so you're still afraid. Then Bhagavan says, look at it carefully. Which it are we to look at? Are we to look at the snake or are we to look at the rope? In our view, it's only a snake. So when Bhagavan says, look at it carefully, he means look at the snake carefully. Sometimes people ask, Bhagavan, when in who am I? What is the I we have to investigate? Is it ego or the real self? Bhagavan, to such questions, Bhagavan would always say ego. There's a reason why he said that. That's like, if you ask Bhagavan, am, am I might look carefully at the snake or the rope. If Bhagavan tells you, look carefully at the rope, you'll say, but I don't see any rope. I only see a snake. Then look carefully at the snake. If you look carefully at the snake, what are you actually looking at? You're only looking at a rope. Though it seems to you you're looking at a snake, you're actually looking at a rope. And if you look at it carefully enough, you'll see that it's only a rope, but it was never a snake. Likewise, look carefully at the subject. Look carefully at the one who is perceiving all this, and you will see there's no such thing. There's only pure awareness. So it's not a two-stage process. It's not a of first seeing the ego and then seeing the real self, we are all aware of ego. When we, we all say, I, 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 I am sitting, I am talking, I am angry, I am sad, I am happy, I am this, I am that. I is the center of our world. There's not, none of us who are not aware of I. So but we're now, instead of being aware of I as it actually is, we're aware of I as it seems to be, which is ego. We're aware of ourselves as, I am Michael. That is not, I, I am, my, Michael is not what I really am, but so long as I'm aware of myself as, I am Michael, I have to look carefully at this I am to find out who am I. The more I look at I am, the less I'm looking at Michael. Michael meaning the whole uh, baggage that makes up Michael, all the thoughts, feelings, desires, hopes, everything. The whole baggage, ignore that baggage, who is it? Who is this I who says I am Michael? Who is this I? What is it that is aware of itself as I am Michael? Who is the perceiver of all these phenomena? So we, we, we try to turn our attention back. That's all we need to attend to. This I that is now aware of phenomena. This I that is now aware of itself as Michael. If we focus on this I, all the all phenomena and Michael and all adjuncts will drop off and what will remain is the pure eye, which is what we actually are. So there's no two-stage process. Just, there's only, there's only one thing there. It seems to be a snake. Look at it carefully. If you look at it carefully enough, you'll see it's just a rope. There never was a snake. So look at the ego carefully enough and you'll we'll see that it is just but what actually exists is just pure awareness. Nothing else is there at all. There never was any ego, never was any world, body, anything. It's only pure awareness. I think that's... Uh, that's yeah. I think that, uh, I hope that answers two questions. The other question about um, um, what happens to ego in sleep. Nothing happens to ego in sleep. Ego is something that happens only in waking and dream. In waking and dream, ego rises and dances around. When it ceases dancing, what remains is just pure awareness. If ego was something that actually exists, we'd have to give some explanation. What happens to it in sleep? Does it go and hide in a hole or does it, um, what happens to it? It doesn't exist at all. It seems to exist in waking and dream. It doesn't seem to exist in sleep. That's all there is to it. Sleep is a state of absolute non-happening. Nothing is. happens in sleep because there's nothing to happen. I mean, there's no phenomena in sleep. There's no neither a perceiver nor a perceived. But, yes, you are. Yes. 
Uh, what Mary wants to know is that when she's sleeping, is she in the absolute? No, you are the absolute. And what happens when you die? Uh, does the ego then kind of... Uh, well, it, the what ego... Happens? Can, what, what happens when a dream comes to an end? You have two options. Either you fall asleep or you come to another dream. Exactly the same with death. Either you temporarily remain in, in sleep or you uh, immediately grasp some other form. You start using another dream. What we call death is nothing but the end of one dream. We, we're never aware of our dead body. We, uh, we are aware of other bodies when they die, but our own body when it dies, we're not aware of. So this dream comes to an end. What happens then? I, well, there's only two alternatives. Either we begin another dream or we sleep. But because if we haven't eradicated ego, this, whatever sleep we have will not last very long. We'll, we'll again start dreaming. So if we want eternal sleep, we have to get rid of this ego by seeing what we actually are. Um, Michael, she has another part of this question. Yeah, okay. so, uh, she wants to know that does the ego retain its identity when it re-emerges? Is that what you mean? Every, every time it emerges, it emerges with an identity. Uh, it's one, one identity or another. In, um, what we call our present life is like a, a, a big dream divided into so many uh, smaller, a dream divided into so many chunks. Because we fall asleep and then we come back to this dream again. We fall asleep and come back to this dream again. So the whole of our life we can consider as one dream. Within that one dream, there are many mini dreams. Because every night we fall asleep and within our sleep we have so many dreams. So there are dreams within dreams within dreams. E in each dream, we have an identity. We, when one dream comes to an end, we, another dream starts and we have some other identity. So the, the ego never exists without an identity, without identifying itself with some form or other, some, some body. Uh, so what Mary wants to know is that uh, when uh, this sort of, um, um, if another dream emerges after death, another yes, ego, yes. then will it uh, continue some of the qualities which were there previously? Oh, yes, yeah. Well, what will continue, um, our will, our likes, our dislikes, our desires, our hopes and everything, the, 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 the seeds of all these things are what's called vasanas. So our desires and likes, dislikes, hopes, fears in seed form are what are called vasanas. Those vasanas come with us. Um, yeah, it is just the ego. Yeah, yeah but the vasanas are not the ego. They're the ego's vasanas. But um, it, it's like the, the, the ego is like a general and the vasanas are like its army. Every time the, the, the army goes out to, to fight a war, the general leads it. And in every war, some of the, some of the soldiers get uh, killed, but they have to be very... The general can't afford to be without his army, so he, he recruits uh, other, other soldiers. So over the course of time, our vasanas may be changing. But their ego remains the same. So I think we need to, okay, um, we, we, okay, uh, just say a question. I'm not sure we can answer it, but just say. Uh, if the, you come forward, then I can hear you clearly. Uh, in the dream state, um, our ego exists, our will also exists. So in self-inquiry, is it possible to practice self-inquiry in the dream state? Yes. This is a, you're in a dream state now. Can you practice self-inquiry? Yes. You, then you've answered your own question. There is, the only state you cannot practice self-inquiry is sleep. There are only two states, actually. There's dream and there's sleep. This, what we take to be waking, any dream, while we're dreaming it, it seems to be waking. 
So what we, uh, this present dream, because it's our current dream, we seem to be awake. But in any other dream, we also seem to be awake. So yes, dream, dream, in, in dream, dream is the only place to do self-investigation. So you. you can't do it in any other state. So um, uh, Michael, thank you very, very much. Uh, I yeah, know- Thank you. <laughs> And thank you, um, everybody, please, uh, our thanks uh, go to you for taking this time. And I think everybody wishes you all the best with your mother and all our yes. love and uh, goodwill. We are, we, we, are, we are all enfolded in Bhagavan's love. So there's truly speaking, as Bhagavan said, where's the coming and going? There's no coming and going. So um, at a personal level, we feel all these things. But um, we, when, when, um, when I told my mother what the, the diagnosis, that she had advanced cancer, her reaction was, so what? We live, we die, none of us go on forever. And that's the truth. That the truth. We, we, our turn is coming sooner or later. No, but of course, we feel, we feel, we, people who are dear to us, we feel when we lose them. But um, this is all part of life. It's all part of life. So we we have to undergo all these uh, the joys and misery of life until the day when we finally are ready to let go of everything. That is the final total surrender. Thank you so much, Michael. Yeah, I think everybody. Right. Even whether we surrender ourselves or not, we are always wrapped in Bhagavan's love. His love is is the one thing which is always with us. Because his love is always shining in our heart as I. Thank you, Michael. Right. Thank you very much. Right. Thank you.